Hello, thanks for joining us, everyone. And uh, thanks to American Acupuncture Council for having us back. I say us, but um, Matt Callison is not joining us today. So it's just me and our guest, Joe Bickle, Joseph Bickle, and I'll introduce him in a second. Sorry, Matt's not here. He uh, had a little incident with food poisoning, so he will feel better soon, hopefully, but um, didn't really feel up to be in an, on the webinar today. So we're going to be discussing uh, some, some treatment considerations for myofascial trigger points, how to incorporate them into the treatment, a little bit of comparison between those and motor points. So it'll be a really nice discussion that uh, Joe and myself have. So let me um, introduce uh, Joseph Bickle. He is a uh, graduate of the SMAC program, Sports Medicine Acupuncture Certification. So he's a C.SMA. Uh, he also uh, took classes, as I did, in myopain, um, which uh, goes through some various trigger point protocols. Um, I haven't taken all the classes. Joe did take all the classes, so he's certified through myopain. Um, so we'll have a little common language we can discuss and, and maybe talk a little bit about that training also. Um, Joe, do you want to give any background of how you, we can get more into specifics in a bit, but how you incorporate or, or what you do and where you, where you work and such? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I work primarily in two different locations uh, in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. Uh, I work as part of an outpatient program uh, attached to the Alina Health and Abbott Northwestern. Uh, and then I also do supervise uh, at the local school, uh, Northwestern Health Sciences, their Human Performance Center, where we focus uh, primarily on treating uh, athletic conditions. Uh, so obviously treating there, uh, but my patient population tends to be more of the chronic pain and or chronic orthopedic conditions uh, through the Alina Health System. Great. All right, so we'll jump right into the discussion. Uh, we'll start with a PowerPoint. We're not going to have a PowerPoint for the whole, um, whole webinar, but um, we wanted to start with just a little brief discussion on um, a comparison of motor points and trigger points. These are not such a black and white, you know, easy comparison to make because there's a lot of crossover. And on top of that, there's a lot of discrepancy on how people describe a lot of these things. So they're not even always clear delineations between the two. But just since a lot of people use motor points, a lot of people use trigger points, some people use both, it's nice to kind of get a little bit uh, into the uh, the difference slash similarity comparison. So let's go to the um, first slide. Give me just a second. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, so we'll start, like I said, this comparison, but then once we get through the um, the PowerPoint, we'll start talking about some, some key kind of areas, uh, referral patterns, a little bit about how to assess for trigger points, uh, including them into the treatment. And then um, uh, one of the main things we want to talk about today is, uh, is dosage, you know, so how much stimulation do you give? Uh, are you looking for a fasciculation, the duration of treatment? So I, I know I've had a problem and I've talked to Joe about this. Sometimes I've overtreated people. And they come back and, oh, they were so sore, you know, and it's like a little soreness is one thing, but but you can definitely overtreat. So being able to sort of judge how much that person can tolerate is really important. And I know all of us know that from Chinese medicine, but looking at it from this little uh, more my, myofascial stimulation uh, is really an important topic. So let's go into this, Joe. If you have anything to add, we'll just kind of talk about it, but we'll just get through these like early slides to start off with. Anything sure. to add to that now or we'll get i guess we'll probably get into it as we go uh yeah i just guess i'd just like to emphasize that it it really it can get a little confusing uh motor points versus trigger points um and so for anyone listening who has feel that way you're in you're in good company yeah <laughs> excellent so what is it let's start with the motor point um i'm going to use the term motor entry point so motor points are described not consistently, incons inconsistent descriptions of them. Um, a lot of the more precise language is using motor entry points because this specifically tells you it's where the motor nerve enters or penetrates the muscle. So what you're seeing in this image here is a picture of the flexor carpial naris. So what's being held there with the gloved hand is the ulnar nerve, which is traversing down the forearm. But then you see that little collateral branch that the, the hemostats are, are pointing to. That, that um, collateral branch is going and entering 
right into the flexor carpi ulnaris. That's going to be about a third if you drew a line from heart to um, from SI8 to heart seven and made that line divided it in thirds. That's going to be the the uh, proximal and middle third junction thereabouts. It's slight variability on pe person to person, but it's pretty consistent. It's a pretty consistent uh, location. So that's going to be the motor entry point, And we'll talk about other terminology here in a second. Um, so it's not really all, always agreed upon, but that's the definition that I like and that I want to use and that we tend to use in the sports medicine and acupuncture program. So whoops. Uh, all right, so once the motor nerve uh, enters the muscle, though, then it bifurcates and sends branches out, usually proximally and distally, and those branches terminate somewhere in the muscle. And some languages, some, some descriptions, if you look at research, we'll talk about those as being intramuscular motor points. So areas where the, the motor nerve, after it bifurcates and, and travels for a bit, um, depending on the muscle and the person and all that, it's going to terminate at that intramuscular motor point. So that's a motor point also, but that would be an intramuscular motor point versus the motor entry point. So in this image, if you can kind of look somewhere in the center, this is the hamstrings. Somewhere in the center, you'll see MEP. That's the motor entry point. That's where the sciatic nerve sends off a branch, enters the muscle, penetrates in the muscle, then DLP, PLP, I forget what those stand for, proximal and distal. But basically, they're talking about the termination place within the um, those branches that go distal and, and proximally and then terminate at the intramuscular motor point. So that's something that we can talk about and maybe from there make a comparison to uh, trigger points. And Joe, I don't know if you want to jump in here and add any thoughts to this. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's that sums it up pretty well as far as the main differences that I've seen and that I work with um, where the motor point is motor entry point tends to be a lot more predictable. Um, like you were saying, how you're mapping out the flexi carpi ulnaris, uh, whereas <clears throat> the end plates can, can be a little bit less predictable and therefore more palpation based. Um, but mm -hmm. otherwise I, yeah, I would agree. So would you say, and this is the way I see it, uh, a trigger point, when we define a trigger point here in a second, trigger points can exist anywhere in the muscle. So this is showing the biceps from Morris long head. Motor entry point somewhere in the center of the muscle. It's pretty close to UB37, just lateral to UB37. There's another one too, a couple different different motor entry points, but this is the main one. Um, and then those junctions that send out intramuscularly and terminate at where it says PLP and, and DLP, um, those would be the, the area where there's motor end plates, where there's receptors for acetylcholine. It's the yep. neuromuscular junction. You can describe it in structure. You describe it in function. That's where the discrepancy between neuromuscular junction and motor end plates comes in. But in trigger point language, they mention that trigger points tend to form at the highest concentration of motor end plates. So in yep. my mind, that would be at these at these intramuscular motor points, even though they don't have these mapped out. I don't know how variability how much variability it is. Maybe someday there'll be all these uh, maps that say, oh, okay, here's where the distal. Uh, intramuscular motor point is of the biceps or morris, I doubt it is probably much more variable than that. But this would be the, the, the relationship in my mind is there's the motor entry point where the muscle where the motor nerve enters the muscle. And then the intramuscular uh, motor points that terminate somewhere that's probably less predictable in each muscle. Um, and those would be sites where the trigger points tend to form, they could also form really at the motor entry point it could form anywhere in the muscle, but those are going to be the key areas. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Um... It definitely seems like there is some predictability to those to the end plates, mm -hmm. uh, but but I don't. Obviously, I'm. I would assume things like activity, how athletic the person is, their movement patterns would would have an impact on those locations. So yes, mm -hmm. yeah, I would agree. It is interesting that you mentioned predictability because um, for those who use trigger points and and have looked at uh, Janet Travell and David Simon's book, um, uh, Myofascial Pain and Dysfunction uh, Trigger Point Manual. In her early editions, up until just recently, into, into the recent edition, she had X's, not because they were definitive locations for trigger points. She made it clear that they could exist anywhere in the muscle, but she had X's just clinically being a, a very skilled palpator and clinician of areas where you, know, you tend to find trigger points. You know, it tends to, it tends to form here in the muscle. They kind of go to areas um, that, uh, that what wasn't 
trying to imply that they would always be there, but they were go-to um, based on clinical experience and just seeing a whole ton of patients. Um, in the recent uh, edition of that, they took those X's out, which I don't know, I could see an argument for because you have to palpate all through the muscle and look. But uh, I kind of like the X's. I don't know. <laughs> How do you feel about that, Joe? Uh, I mean, I, I see uh, two sides to that argument. Um, I, I actually kind of like them not there because it does force the practitioner to palpate mm -hmm. um, as opposed to kind of one, I think one thing acupuncture specifically can kind of fall into a trap on is they're used to that precise location. Like tell me the measurements and then I can find it. And they mm -hmm. can lose that ability to palpate exactly what they're feeling for. Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. And that's, I think, the reason they, not for acupuncturists per se, but that's the reason they were yeah. taken out. I mean, yeah. But yeah, as I understand, that is, that is why. Yeah. If you do work with trigger points a lot, though, you will find that they tend to be not, I wouldn't say yeah, predictable, but yeah. it tends to be go-to areas. You know, you tend to find some some uh, consistency, but, you know, that's that's the trap. You're right, is, is you can then start to force yourself to think, you know, there should be a trigger point here because of the, the pain referral or whatever, um, and you don't palpate carefully and, and you end up missing something that if you were to, to be more open-minded, open, kind of open possibility about it, I think you would just uh, not get hung up on trying to force it into that location. Yeah. So, all right. So then motor entry points, intramuscular motor points, trigger point is a hyper irritable spot in skeletal muscles associated with hypersensitive palpable nodules and a taut band. So when you're palpating for a trigger point, we can talk about what that uh, refers to. The spot is painful on compression and can give rise to characteristic referral pain, referred tenderness motor dysfunction and autonomic phenomena. So that's the definition from Travell and Simon's book. And um, it's a mouthful in and of itself. Um, but that tells you that there's a hypersensitive palpable nodule there. So whereas a motor point is, uh, or especially a motor entry point is an anatomical thing. You know, you have that, whether there's dysfunction in the muscle or no dysfunction, it's there. It's, it's, it might be slightly var variable from person to person, but it's in a relatively consistent location. If the muscle's in dysfunction, the motor point's there. If the muscle's healthy, the motor point's there. It's just part of your anatomy. Whereas trigger points are talking more specifically about dysfunction. They could form at a motor entry point. They could form at the intramuscular motor points. They could form somewhere else in the muscle, probably most likely at the intramuscular motor points, but they're, um, they're a sign of dysfunction where there's hyper irritability and um, there's characteristic referral patterns and other other phenomena that you see with it. So, good, Joe. I'm going to move on if, unless you want to add something to that. No, I think that summed it up pretty well. All right. So we'll come back to this. Uh, we'll take the PowerPoint away for now. We're going to come back to this when we use an example later and discuss uh, the quadratus lumborum. Um, but uh, just glancing at it for now, you can see these characteristic referral patterns that are mapped out. When you're looking at these referral patterns, you um, if you don't know the mapping, there's something that you want to know about them is that dark red doesn't indicate more intensity of pain. The dark red indicates more of the um, tendency of where those muscles refer to. And this one is from an old edition. It has the X's in there. Modern ones don't have, the, the newer edition doesn't have that X, but don't worry about that so much, but that characteristic uh, darker red area is where you're going to more commonly see that referral. And then there's the spillover kind of speckly red. That could be just as severe pain at those spillover areas, but they're less frequent, less frequently going to be experienced there. So that's what the mapping is. So let's uh, bring the PowerPoint away and we can come back to that in a little bit. All right. So Sit this out so I can see Joe. There we go. Good. Um, so we talked a little bit about that uh, difference between motor points and trigger points. So let's look at how you would incorporate, if you're using motor points, how you'd incorporate trigger points in, or, or even if you're not using trigger points, um, how would you incorporate? What would you be doing? What would lead you to think trigger points? And um, how would you sort of make that a part of your treatment? Sure. Sure. So, I mean, you know, just looking at the, the mapping that Travell's done, I think 
thinking about it from like uh, someone who is new to orthopedics or new, certainly new to trigger points, I think that's your that's your first go to is uh, based on patient symptom presentation. Um, and then that's going to narrow it down. So like if we're if we're looking at the QL as an example, you know, it's lighting up parts of the hip parts of the SI joint, there are gonna be multiple muscles that do so. Uh, but it does give you a way of zooming in relatively quickly. Um, to kind of like, all right, I'm going to start thinking about glutes, I'm going to start thinking about QL. And I, then you can also if you're more orthopedically inclined, you can start thinking about the spine and uh, other things as well. Uh, so that's a good first step. Uh, I think a good second step would be reading some of the Travell's information. She gives a lot of more specific symptom presentation, uh, and as well as other ways uh, to incorporate. So talking about the relationship between glute trigger points and their effect on, on the QL as well. Uh, and then uh, another good way of starting would be uh, active and passive ranges of motion. Um, I know when I first started kind of getting into this, that was that was kind of a very nice, like, just memorize how the body can move and then have a patient see what they can and cannot do uh, yeah. and incorporate that into a pre and post uh, exam. Uh, and then lastly, you know, like just what I've been talking about before, palpation, you know, the more you can kind of get a feel for the tissue, it's going to lead you in a direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the trick uh, with those who use motor points. Uh, the, the trick is there is crossover because in sports medicine, acupuncture um, in the certification program, we tend to use more discussion of motor points and we use a lot of the same thing, you know, range of motion, um, looking at muscle inhibition. That could be something I know Travell talks about muscles becoming inhibited when there's trigger point formation in there. So there's definitely a lot of crossover um, yeah. in the sense that you know, well, if somebody has limited range of motion in the upper trapezius, for instance, do I go with the motor point or do I go with the trigger point? What's my, what's, uh, what's going to be the, the thing that leads me to one or the other? And they can be the same thing because the trigger point might yeah. form at the motor entry point location. But let's assume it's a little off the, the motor entry point location. Which one do I use? So what's, what's your um, uh, way of differentiating those, even though there is so much crossover? What's your way of differentiating those usage? Sure. I, I, I guess I tend to look at it, um, and especially this is going to kind of feed off of my smack background, but motor points tend to, or I use them more so for global uh, aspects of treatment. So looking at the posture, like if we're, if we're talking about upper trapezius, upper cross syndrome, you know, I'm definitely going to mm -hmm. be thinking more uh, motor entry point. Uh, whereas if the patient's coming in for, you know, that temporal ram's horn headache, uh, I'm going to be specifically thinking, all right, I need to feel the upper trapezius, find some, uh, trigger points in that region or not advanced that, that are kind of almost recreating those symptoms. Uh, that's a good bet. If you're finding a tender point that's saying, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that goes right to where my, I typically have a headache. Mm -hmm. That's why I'll tend to lean in on, on treating the trigger point specifically over the motor point. Yeah, I gotcha. Let me, let me say it, tell me if this is because I, I, this is what I heard and this is kind of how I think about it too. But let's use back to the upper cross syndrome, upper cross syndrome, patients coming in with a headache, a neck pain, maybe cervical type headaches, tension headaches that are coming up the cervical spine and then kind of radiating along the gallbladder channel to the temple. So knowing the trigger point referrals, upper traps would be one of the key structures that I'd want to look at for that. However, they yeah. have upper cross syndrome. So once I've diagnosed and assessed that, that posture, and, and I can see that posture is part of that pain pattern, I could choose motor points such as the rhomboids, lower traps to help kind of re return some uh, awareness to that area so that the, the person's able to engage them, especially if I give them some exercises afterwards to help engage that. I might include pec minor uh, as a way to let that pec minor soften it's not what's causing the pain. It's not the direct cause of the pain, but it's part of that um, that postural symptomology. And then the upper upper trap trigger point to speak almost directly to that that pain referral. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I definitely consider it like trigger points to be like the branch treatment of uh, you know to use a Chinese medicine term, the branch treatment of kind of assessing those kind of like postural and mobility issues, um, where.
the trigger point itself is kind of a symptom of what what's going on underneath. Uh, but it still needs to be treated, you know, thank you. So you're incorporating, I need to treat this trigger point, this exact one part of the region of that muscle, but I also need to balance that with motor entry points uh, to create a more global effect. Mm -hmm. I know, and leading up to this webinar uh, on Facebook, um, there was a question about um, needling motor points. Will that release the trigger point or will that have a clinical effect on the trigger point? Um, so should there be, and I think this is going to be very opinionated by the way, but should there be, uh, if you find that trigger point in the upper trap, should I needle the, the motor point? Assuming the trigger points at a, at a different location, should I needle the motor point to release that trigger point in the upper traps or should I go right to the trigger point? Sure. Any thoughts I, on that? I, I mean, I think this would actually, this, this would lead into our conversation about dosage because needling mm -hmm. into that trigger point is gonna have a certain level of sensation versus needling into the motor point. Um, mm -hmm. And to me, that becomes a, a question about who's, who's sitting in front of me. Uh, I think there are times where I would say needling the trigger point is exactly what you need to do. Uh, and there are other times where I don't think that's a great idea. I think uh, just balancing the tree, you know, kind of doing, focusing more so on the bilateral trigger point or bilateral mm -hmm. motor points and then postural issues might be a better approach depending on who's sitting in front of you. Yeah, gotcha. It's interesting, the, the idea of trigger points, I'm gonna make a, a comparison to something. Um, I do, I'm in Florida, so I can do injection. Um, and I use a, a modified like buffered D5W, a 5% dextrose and sterile water, which can be great for trigger points. I use it for trigger points. It's also used for perineural injection. So when you're working with cutaneous nerves, so a lot of pain syndromes, you can palpate these cutaneous nerves and do very superficial injection and using the D5W to, um, desensitize some of the nerves because the idea is that when nerves are um, uh, absent, uh, when there's glucose oxygen deprivation, when there's pressure on the nerves, they, they're not getting oxygen, they're not getting glucose. Well, dextrose is about the same thing. You can desensitize them with this dextrose solution, kind of bathing that area in the dextrose solution. And the person who, um, who really uh, spearheaded a lot of this work is the uh, MD in uh, New Zealand. And he uses it really comprehensively for a lot of different things, even like sciatica. And it's like you're desensitizing that most distal portion of the nerve. It kind of reminds me a little bit of distal points in acupuncture, even though they're, these yeah. aren't, you know, it might be around the knee or wherever the, the pain presentation is. But it's almost like desensitizing that end, that end yeah. of the nerve kind of, you know, refers back to that neurologically back to the main unit. I kind of feel like trigger points are a little bit like that too versus motor points. Is sometimes you want to use the motor point, which is going to affect all the branches distal from that, all the intramuscular motor points, but I kind of wonder if it has like a little dispersed effect, you know, it, it's, it's effect is dispersed among all of those, which is very regulatory versus yeah. sometimes you need to zoom in right at that most distal branch that's irritated. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I, to kind of play off of that, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, all right, let's try the, let's try the motor entry point mm -hmm. and then reassessing the trigger point and saying, all right, mm -hmm. how's that feeling now that I've done this? You know, I, I think that's a good, good thought process to be going. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, on that topic, and you already started getting into dosage, I think we should probably uh, um, go into that. Could you define uh, dosage again? Because it's, it's a term I hear in acupuncture world, but, you know, often when people hear dosage, they think medicine, which is medicine. Yeah. But <laughs> it, think, you know, yeah, it, medicine. it can be, yeah, it can be a little... Uh, tricky. I've, I've broadened my definition quite uh, a lot in the last year. Um, so I considered anything that's going into the treatment. So um, I think the way it gets talked about and has been researched the most is number of you know treatments within proximity one another. So number of treatments mm -hmm. per week, uh, but needle retention time. You know we talk about in school. You know like the twenty three some minutes and talking about chi cycling. Um, you can kind of get locked into that and stop thinking about it, but there's definitely a difference between needling, you know, leaving a needle in for a minute to five minutes to 15 to 35. Uh, those are all going to have uh, a different effect uh, on particular patients. Uh, the amount of needles uh, and then the amount of stimulation, like we're with mm -hmm. talking about trigger points, the local twitch response, uh, doing some type of manual technique on the needle, e-stim. Uh, 
Uh, I think these all have a level of stimulation, a level of dosage, uh, and they all do slightly different things. As an example, there are times where what you want to do is to get multiple uh, local twitches versus another patient who's going to have a really bad reaction to that, and maybe e-stim is a better way to go. Uh, but then even then, you can kind of start building off of that, of like what are, what are the accessory techniques you're doing? Uh, what effect is that going to have on your treatment and how often you need to be treating and how much needling you do? Like if you're doing a ton of myofascial work, like we learn, you know, like, uh, like we learn in SMAC, how much needling do you really do? Um, mm -hmm. I know going through the program, we'd spend like, you know, you're spending like five minutes doing a, tech, a myofascial release technique. And then you'd have uh, you or Matt just being like, I just want to remind everybody, you've already done the needling at this point. So you don't have to do all that a ton of myofascial work. And that's an, I just think an example of moderating the dosage. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what you're giving them, what you're giving them uh, as far as herbs or homework assignments. Uh, I know there's some interesting research that talks about using exercise to minimize that post-treatment soreness. I certainly think if you're incorporating that, you need to be thinking, how much work can I do with the needle versus how much work am I going to have the patient do when they're at home? And yeah, I just think those are all different examples of, of what you could term dosage. Yeah, I kind of also add a, a thought to that is that um, upper cross syndrome would be an example of this. Somebody can't tolerate a, a lot of needle stimulation. Well, I mean, that's a lot of needles to do the, the rhomboid major, rhomboid minor, middle traps, lower traps, pec minor, um, especially if you're doing this bilateral. I mean, there's a lot that goes into that. So I start to think distal points sometimes too mm -hmm. and think which channels are those you know if those muscles are part of a sinew channel and maybe i can affect differently you know maybe not as direct but maybe i can affect those lower traps with the urinary bladder channel a distal point that i might be using anyways and i can have that have some regulatory effect i think its effect is going to be a little bit more dispersed and its yeah. effect is going to be stronger if that distal points there plus the local point but you know, the person can't tolerate, I can still kind of build energy in the channel to help that, you know, uh, relate to the, the lower traps in that case uh, without having to needle them directly if I do need to minimize. Or maybe to release the pec minor, I'm going to use a lung channel point that's going to have a little less, uh, less um, you know, impact. It's not going to be as strong of a, a needle sensation as going into the pec minor with a, with a needle. Yeah, and I would agree. Um... You know, you can have two, you can have one patient and then 30 minutes later, another patient, same condition. If we're doing upper cross, you're doing the, the upper trapezius trigger point and you're going to make it worse. Or someone else, you, if you do the upper cross, you know, the tr trigger point, you're going to make them way better. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, I think the trick is kind of learning how and when to do that. Uh, I do think there are some tells. But uh, ultimately, just building your clinical experience around how your how patients are going to respond to that. But yeah, that's the thing I love about Chinese medicine is that it gives us it gives us those options. If yeah, I can't treat the trigger point directly, I can I can use lung seven. Yeah, it's funny. I think when I've over treated people, it comes down to this one thing. Um, and I'm going to use a, a, a phrase that I heard this in context from a, another educator I used to teach with um, sports medicine at, at, uh, acupuncture, uh, Patrick Cunningham. Mm, he uh, yeah. discussion. He reminded it was this was an online discussion, but it reminded folks about a um, saying they have in chiropractic, which is being addicted to the audible. Mm. You know, so in that case, it's trying to adjust and get that pop. And sometimes if the joints move, but you're like, you know, I'm looking for that that audible click. I feel yeah. like fasciculations are that, and this was his his point, that fasciculations are that in, in the acupuncture world, especially more sports acupuncture-based world, is like uh, getting addicted to that big muscle twitch. And sometimes that you put the needle in and boom, it's right there, but other times not. And, and you know, maybe you overstimulate looking for that big muscle twitch because that's yeah. what's driving, or, you know, that's what you, you judge as being what's important for the treatment. Maybe their body's telling you something different. I don't know. So when I have no, over, I, over treated, when dosage has been wrong, it's for me, that's what it's been. Yeah, I, I'm guilty of that too. Uh, certainly. I mean, who doesn't love just getting that like that nice big pop uh, yeah. of the muscle? Um, yeah. Uh, well, what was I going to say based off of that? Um, oh, shoot. Just 
escaped me, but you said something that, that reminded me of that. But yeah, um, I think certainly knowing when and, and how much, uh, yeah. and, and, and knowing that, you know, I also like to say it's like it's not it's not the worst thing in the world to overtreat somebody um, as long as you're communicating with them like, hey, I'm going to sure. do this thing. You're probably going to be sore one to two days. Anything over that is I consider to be too strong. You know, I've definitely had patients be like, oh, yeah, I think think we did a little too much. And, and then it's mm -hmm. and then we move on. We know we know to treat that, you know, to do a little mm -hmm. less stem. But, <clears throat> but the, I need to close with this because we're running a little short on time. But the fasciculations. I do think is worth spending a minute or so on. And I'll mention my thoughts on it. Um, I don't think there's an answer to if you need a fasciculation or not. I feel like the fasciculation is important, but I think oftentimes we miss these very small background, quiet fasciculations, which is maybe what that person's body needs. And I mm -hmm. have some ways that I, I sometimes like I, I for um, stomach 36, if I'm using that, uh, for the, the um, tibialis anterior or just any tib anterior motor, uh, motor point or, or trigger point, I'll go down distally to about the liver, liver four area and just go a little lateral, which would be right on the tibialis anterior tendon. And yes, yeah, sometimes you need all that region of, of tib anterior. And you can clearly see and feel a fasciculation, but sometimes you can't, but you can fairly clearly feel like a little pull on the tendon. And it's like, I might've missed that on the needle and like kept on looking for a fasciculation. And I think mm -hmm. for some people that their body is that, that, that was the therapeutic outcome. And I, and I got it and I missed it if I don't have a way of assessing it. So sometimes I think when we talk about fasciculations, we're not talking about the spectrum of, of that muscle fasciculation that can happen. That can be from almost imperceptible to you can physically see it. Um, yeah. Sometimes we talk about fasciculations as being that part of the spectrum is the part you can physically see or if you, you know, right there, you see it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I think it's important to understand that. I mean, even the research is going to tell you, oh, you know, like getting a, getting a twitch, it does have a response. It has a local response, has a global response. Uh, but searching for it can actually recreate a lot of the nociceptive, uh, well, increase the presentation of a lot of the nociceptive chemicals that you're actually trying to get rid of. So yes, getting the twitch can matter to a degree, but it's very easy to overdo if you go hunting for it. Uh, and I do think like you're saying, like trying to look further, like further distally or proximally along the muscle, looking for those small little or twitches is, is probably a, a smarter way to go. Yeah. Then also, I think uh, when it's like that and it's assuming you're in the right location, you know, sometimes you take the needle out, repalpate, um, oh yeah, I think I was just a little off and you put it in, you get it right away. But sometimes you're right on the right spot. And then sometimes you just have to use good needle technique. And instead yep. of just like, you know, hanging away at the muscle, you just have to, sort of, you have to coax it a little bit, you know, to- Indeed, you know, get, yeah. Um, yeah. Little English on it. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's uh, that's been the change for me in treatment is not just assuming that it's, I didn't get the twitch because I'm in the wrong location and just keep on wailing away at it, but just, uh, see that as the body needs a little bit more, um, a little more mechanical stimulation, quiet stimulation in that area and, and, and let, let it come to the needle in those cases mm -hmm. where it's probably more of a deficiency case, you know, cause the excess portions you put the needle in and you know, it's, yeah, it's there. Yeah. So, yeah, I would agree. All right. Well, uh, Joe's going to be, uh, presenting at the, um, 2023 uh, specific sports and orthopedic acupuncture symposium. Maybe you'll get a little more into some of this um, at the at the symposium. Um, I know the dosage thing is a really interesting thing, and you you've talked a lot about various research that that discusses this, and I think that's uh, useful to hear it from that perspective. So, hopefully, more on that topic later. But, yes, that is uh, the plan. Well, we were going to talk about QL, but I think we're probably a little uh, short on time, so. Maybe we'll leave it at that. We got a lot of good information discussed in this. All right. So thank you, Joe. Thanks for, for being the guest. Uh, sorry, Matt couldn't join us. Thanks again to the American Acupuncture Council for having us. It's always great to, to be um, available for these webinars. And uh, I didn't get who is here next week, but uh, I think it's usually put up on the screen. So there we go. Awesome.
So hopefully you guys can uh, uh, join next week. And thanks again. And see you guys another time. Thank you, Joe. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Brian.